تنزل ولا تعمل بالخير وبك نستعين يا فتاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my dear sisters and brothers how are you guys alhamdulillah inshallah I hope you and your family are good and enjoying the last few days of Ramadan can you guys hear me uh, I have oh well, subhanallah only four people yeah alhamdulillah I hope everyone will be joining soon inshallah um Alhamdulillah, we are into another beautiful day. And the best part is that all the past many days, we are spending most of our time with Quran and Zikr. Alhamdulillah. I'm sure, uh, like mine, your notebook is filled with many, many action points and lessons too. And uh, definitely, uh, you have been working on implementing those points into action, just like me. <laughs> um, what we have to take care of is like um, always it happens that in Ramadan, our routine is really beautiful. We are uh, working with Quran. We are uh, doing Azkar. And uh, soon after uh, the month uh, passes and it finishes or it ends um, we struggle keeping track of what we were doing throughout this month so we have to stick to all what we have started during this month alhamdulillah and we have to try to stick to that after it has ended um, my target these days is to make post-it notes and place on my fridge as a reminder. So I would continue doing the same, what I'm doing during this month of Ramadan. Um, I'm also setting up uh, daily, weekly, and hourly reminders in my mobile because that's the thing that I have in access most of the time. And uh, these are, for me, hourly reminders have worked really miracle like uh every hour if i am busy in something and i get a notification a buzz that i have to do some sicker i always uh, just for a minute out of that busy hour i take a minute and do a little bit of any of the sicker that i have you know put that reminder for so inshallah um, um if you think that it will work for you try putting reminders it could be hourly it could be weekly daily on any basis and um, inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to keep us tongue moist with zikr always inshallah mm -hmm. sorry sorry about that I'm sure you will be um exciting excited and waiting for um, the next juice of see so let's not wait and uh, see let's see what we will have uh, now to add to our notebook inshallah so bismillah for juice 28 assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim bismillahi ar-rahman ar-rahim والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم اهد قلبي وسدد لساني واسلل سخيمة قلبي آمين يا رب العالمين جز نمبر 28 سورة المجادلة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد سمع الله قول التي تجادلك في زوجها وتشتكي إلى الله والله يسمع تحاوركما إن الله سميع بصير Certainly has Allah heard the speech of the woman who argues with you concerning her husband and directs her complaint to Allah and Allah hears your dialogue. Indeed, Allah is hearing and seeing. This verse is about Khawla radiallahu anha whose husband pronounced zihar to her. And Zihar was basically, you know, when a man would say to his wife that you are to me like the back of my mother. And this was a way of giving permanent, irrevocable divorce. 
So Khawla radiallahu anha, when her husband said that to her, she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asking if her marriage was still valid. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told her that no, it was no longer valid because nothing specific had been revealed regarding this matter as of yet. So Khawla radiallahu anha, she tashtaki ilallah, she complained to Allah, she begged and she pleaded. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that blessed is the one whose hearing encompasses all things. I heard some of the words of Khawla, but some of her words were not clear to me. Meaning I don't know exactly what she said, but I heard some things. When she complained to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about her husband, and she was saying that, O Messenger of Allah, he has consumed my youth and I split my belly for him. Meaning I had many children with him. But when I grew old and could no longer bear children, he declared lihar upon me. O Allah, I complain to you. And she kept complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until Jibreel brought down these verses. That indeed Allah has heard the statement of the woman who was arguing with you about her husband and who was complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah heard your conversation. Indeed Allah is hearing and seeing. If you think about it, the law regarding lihal could have been revealed without this incident. Or it could have been revealed even before Khawla radiallahu anha experienced this. But Khawla radiallahu anha was honored by becoming the cause for the revelation of this law. And we are taught the law regarding this matter first by being reminded of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heard this woman. Aisha radiallahu anha was in the same room and she did not hear everything that Khawla radiallahu anha was saying. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heard her. And this woman, she came and she was talking, she was defending herself, she was arguing and fighting for justice. Meaning she was not accepting the injustice that was done to her. So she spoke out because she wanted a solution. She spoke out because she wanted to save her marriage. And when she did not get that help from people because they weren't able to offer that to her, she didn't quit over there. She pleaded to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She complained to Him, Azza wa Jal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heard her. So what is the lesson? The lesson is that Allah subhanahu subhanahu wa ta'ala certainly hears his servants. So do not forget to complain to him. Do not forget to put your grief, your worries before him, Azza wa Jal. Invite his mercy by putting your weakness and your helplessness before him. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows your situation. Remember that complaining to Allah does not mean saying things like, why did this happen, O Allah? That is actually complaining about Allah. And that is something that we don't do. Because we know that nothing happens without His will. And whatever He wills is based on His wisdom and knowledge. So we don't question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decisions. Because that would imply that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made an error. وَالْعِيَاذُ billah. So we don't say things like that. That, oh Allah, why did this happen? And how come this happened? No. Complaining to Allah means putting forth your grief and your worries and your state of helplessness before Him Azza wa Jal. So in difficulty, complain to Allah, not about Allah. And the lesson that we get here is that the solution to our problems comes from Allah and only Allah Azza wa Jal. So while you stand up for yourself and you seek justice, please Please do it the right way. Don't seek justice by turning away from Allah or away from His book or away from His law or by resenting what He has revealed. No, seek justice by turning towards Allah. And one of the greatest weapons that you have, the greatest strength that you have is that you are able to call upon Allah. You are able to complain to Allah like Khawla radiallahu anha did. So make dua. Sometimes we see that laws regarding our particular situation are not there. Or sometimes they are. Sometimes they're in your favor and other times they're not in your favor. So whatever your predicament is, however the law may have been used against you or to harm you 
or to deprive you, whatever your predicament is, please, please, tashtaki ilallah, complain to Allah and ask Him to make a way out for you. Just as He made a way out for Khawla radiallahu anha, He can also make a way out for you because He is Samirun Basir. He is ever hearing. He is ever seeing. He hears your pleas and He sees your condition. He knows what you're going through. So call upon Him. Invite His mercy. And then it is mentioned that those who pronounce lihar among you to separate from their wives, they are not consequently their mothers. Meaning just because a man says to his wife that you are my mother, meaning you are prohibited on me for physical intimacy just like my mother is, yani his saying that does not make his wife his mother. Their mothers are none but those who gave birth to him. And indeed, they are saying an objectionable statement. Meaning this is a sinful statement. To say to your wife that you are like my mother, this is sinful. And a falsehood. Meaning it is wrong. It is invalid. But indeed, Allah is afuwun ghafur. He is pardoning and forgiving. So he has made a way out for his servants when they make this mistake. So what is the way of tawbah? How is it that a person can come out of this situation? And those who pronounce lihar from their wives and then wish to go back on what they said, then there must be the freeing of a slave before they touch one another. That is what you are admonished thereby. And Allah is acquainted with what you do. And he who does not find a slave, then a fast for two months consecutively. And this means that these fasts have to be without a break. Meaning if a person misses even one fast, then they have to start all over again before they touch one another. And he who is unable, then the feeding of 60 poor persons. Meaning if a person does not have a slave, then they should fast for two months. And if a person is not able to fast, then they have to feed 60 poor people. That is for you to believe completely in Allah and His Messenger. Meaning you must revive your faith now. You must do this as part of completing your faith. And those are the limits set by Allah. And for the deniers is a painful punishment. So we see here that pronouncing lihar does not affect the marriage. Meaning it does not cause divorce. However, it is a major sin. And this is why the man who says these words is penalized. He has to give the compensation. And this shows us that for words are also consequences. Meaning there is repentance required for what we say from our mouths even. And then we learn over here that sadaqa, charity, and fasting, siyam, both of these are a means of kafara, a means of expiation for the sins that we commit. Because when there is a monetary fine, or when we have to practice self-control through fasting, then through this process we are learning. We are learning more self-control. And a lot of times, you know, people cause a lot of damage to one another, especially in marriage, by uncontrolled use of the tongue. So these consequences teach us that we are responsible for what we say and we must guard our words. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُحَادُّونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ Indeed, those people who oppose Allah and His Messenger, literally they oppose Allah and His Messenger, such as Iblis, or people who hate, you know, for example, the Qur'an. They are enemies to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. And this is why they oppose anything about Islam, meaning their life mission is to, you know, spit hate about Islam and Muslims wherever possible. Then such people are abased. Kubitu, they will be abased as those before them were abased. They will be kubitu kama kubita ladina min qablihim. And we have certainly sent down verses of clear evidence. And for the disbelievers is a humiliating punishment. So we see here that opposing the command of Allah and His Messenger, yes, this is done by those who hate Islam, but sometimes this is also done by those people who claim to be Muslim. How? When they outright disobey the commands that are very clear. Meaning, a person finds out what they're supposed to do, but still they refuse to abide by those commands. 
This is a huge mistake. This is a cause of humiliation in this world and in the hereafter. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that such people are kubitu. They will never ever be successful. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said that وَجُعِلَ الذِّلَّةُ وَالصَّغَارُ عَلَى مَنْ خَالَفَ أَمْرِي That humiliation and disgrace is for those people who oppose my command. And we learn that such people will not even be allowed to enter Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ said that all of my ummah will enter paradise except the one who refuses. So the people asked, who is that? He said, مَنْ أَطَاعَنِي دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَنْ عَصَانِي فَقَدْ أَبَى That whoever obeys me will enter Jannah. And whoever disobeys me has in fact refused. And so such people will not enter paradise. وَالْعِيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also warns us in the Qur'an, that فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَن تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ That let those beware who descend from the Prophet's order, lest a fitna should strike them, a tribulation should fall upon them, or a painful punishment. So this verse clearly establishes the status of hadith. That we cannot say that, oh, this is just the words of the Prophet wasallam, so we don't have to take them seriously. No, we must take them seriously. Because those who oppose the Prophet wasallam, who disobey his command, then for such people is disgrace in this life and in the next life. On the day when Allah will resurrect them all, meaning not a single person will be left behind, and inform them of what they did. Subhanallah, the day of judgment is the day when the deeds will be examined, records will be weighed, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had enumerated it. Ahsahu Allahu wa nasu. Allah had enumerated all of their deeds while they forgot it. And Allah is over all things a witness. The fact is that we do things, we say things, and very, very quickly we forget about them. If I were to ask you, what is it that you said when you woke up, meaning the first thing you said, perhaps you won't be able to recall right away. You know, we forget our actions, we forget our words, but just because we have forgotten them, it doesn't mean that they have been lost in thin air. No, what we say, what we do is recorded. And look at the word, أَحْصَاهُ اللَّهُ Allah has enumerated it. Meaning everything that we say, we do, is recorded, it is listed in the record of deeds. This is why people will say on the Day of Judgment that what is with this book that لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا That there is nothing big or small except that it has enumerated. It. So sometimes we also neglect certain things. We don't pay much attention to them, thinking that they're not that important. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perhaps will question us about them. We learn in a hadith that Allah will ask a person on the day of judgment that I was sick and you did not come to visit me. I was thirsty, you did not give me to drink. I was hungry and you did not give me anything to eat. And the person will say, how? Ya Allah, you are the Lord of the worlds. How could that happen to you? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say that my servant was sick. My servant was hungry. My servant was thirsty. And if you had taken care of him, and if you had gone to visit him, if you had fed him, if you had given him to drink, you would have found me over there. You would have found closeness to me. Meaning, why did you leave that good deed? So this shows us that we should not belittle good deeds and we should pay attention to the opportunities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. We should not overlook them. And the actions that we do, the sins that we commit, the words that we say, we should seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over them. Have you not considered that Allah knows what is in the heavens and what is on the earth? There is no private conversation of three, but that He is the fourth of them. Meaning no three people are in a private conversation except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the fourth of them. So basically, no private conversation is private really. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a witness to that conversation. Nor are there five people but that He is the sixth of them. And no less than that and no more except that He is with them in knowledge wherever they are. Then He will inform them of what they did on the day of resurrection. Indeed Allah is of all things knowing. We see that in general whispering you know, having private conversations all the time. This is something that is disliked. Why? Because 
it shows that, you know, people are trying to hide things. And when you're trying to hide things, either you are trying to exclude some people, and that is unfair, or what you're trying to hide is not something nice, which is why you're keeping it private and secret. So why are you trying so hard to keep it secret? So in general, we see that whispering, having private conversations all the time, this is something that is disliked. And this is why we're taught that in the presence of three people, two people should not converse privately. And if it is absolutely necessary, because, you know, certain things cannot be spoken of openly, then you must take permission from the third. And if people are conversing privately, then you must respect their privacy and not sit with them without taking their permission first. So it is made clear over here that no private conversation is actually hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be conscious of Allah, even in your most private conversations that you have with people who are close to you. Then it is said, have you not considered those who were forbidden from private conversation? Because this is something that would annoy the Muslims. But still, they return to that which they were forbidden and converse among themselves about sin and aggression and disobedience to the messenger. These were the hypocrites. Because the Prophet ﷺ forbade people from, you know, whispering into one another's ears, especially, you know, when someone passed by in front of them. So the hypocrites, they still continue to hold such conversations and excluding Muslims. And when they come to you, they greet you with that word by which Allah does not greet you. And these were the Jews. That when they came to the Prophet ﷺ, instead of saying, As-salamu alaykum, they would say, As-salamu alaykum, which means, may you die. And Aisha radiallahu anha, when she realized that, she was really upset. So she said, وَعَلَيْكُمُ السَّامُ وَاللَّعْنَ So on and so forth, that may you die and may you have God's curse, etc., etc. And the Prophet ﷺ said that, Aisha, do not use harsh words. So she said, didn't you hear what they said? And the Prophet ﷺ said that I responded to them. Meaning I just said, وَعَلَيْكُمْ The same be on you. Meaning I responded to them, but I don't have to dirty my tongue in the process. So these people, they would come to the Prophet ﷺ and they would say salam to him in this way and they would say among themselves, why does Allah not punish us for what we say? Meaning if he's really a prophet, then how come we're not being punished? Sufficient for them is hell, which they will enter to burn and wretched is the destination. The fact is that when the heart is dirty, when it is filled with the filth of jealousy and pride and hatred, then it surfaces through such lowly ways. This is why we must pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Ya Allah, cleanse my heart. Allahumma tahir qalbi min al nifaq. That, O oh Allah, clean my heart of any form of hypocrisy. That if there's any hypocrisy in my heart, Ya Allah, wash it away, remove it from my heart. Because such feelings and such beliefs, you know, they do come up every now and then. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who have believed. When you converse privately, meaning when you must hold a private conversation, and sometimes that is necessary because everything does not need to be made public. And certain matters are actually private between friends, between families, between a couple. So when you do have to converse privately, whether it is on the phone or it is, you know, over text messages, it is in a private chat. And certain private chats are such that they're never saved. They disappear right away. Still, what should you do? Do not converse about sin. Meaning, don't talk about things that are sinful, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not approve of. And aggression, meaning words that are aggressive against people, or talking about things that would lead to aggression against people. And disobedience to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But converse about righteousness and piety, and fear Allah to whom you will be gathered. Meaning even in private, do not say and do not whisper and do not type what is sinful. Do not discuss how you're going to sneakily do something wrong, do something sinful, harm another person, or, you know, do this in disobedience to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rather, fear Allah and fear the fact that you are going to meet Him. And only then will you be able to correct your private and your public. 
Because you see, sometimes we are very careful about the words that we say in front of other people on a more public platform. But in our private conversations at home, sometimes, you know, our words are inappropriate. So we have to be careful over there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears, He knows what we say in public, and He also knows He hears what we say in private. Private conversation is only from shaitan, that he may grieve those who have believed. Because what happens is that when people are not included in a certain conversation, then they feel left out. And this is certainly hurtful. But he will not harm them at all, except by permission of Allah. And upon Allah, let the believers rely. وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Sometimes people like to show their greatness before others by making them feel like they don't know anything. That, you know, I know something you don't know. They like to exclude others by pretending like everything is a secret. Or sometimes what people do is that they're talking about you and they let you know that they're talking about you, but they're not going to tell you what they're saying about you. So this is something that's very hurtful. So at that time, remind yourself that whatever they're saying, whatever they're doing, they cannot actually harm me without the permission of Allah. Because the fact is that they don't control my life. They don't control my life. They can whisper, they can converse all they want, they can exclude me all they want, they can leave me out from whatever that they want, but they cannot deprive me from any good that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decreed for me. They cannot take away from me any good that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. And they cannot harm me with anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not written for me. So this way, you will not be sad when people talk like this, when they exclude you. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. O you who have believed, when you are told, space yourselves in assemblies, then make space. Allah will make space for you. Here the etiquette of sitting in a gathering is being taught. That you make space for others and Allah will make space for you. You give to others and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you. You honor others and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will honor you. So no matter where you are, whether this is in the mosque, or it is in a saf, in a row, at home, in prayer, or it is at the dinner table, in a parking lot, on the road, when people need space, then please give them space. Sometimes children fight over such issues, that, you know, I want to hold the iPad only, I want to hold the remote control, I want to sit here, and they don't want to share. So share this ayah with them, that when you include other people, when you make space for others, when you share what you have with others, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will give you what is special. So we should not be selfish and desire all good for ourselves only. No, we must also think about others. Because when we create ease for others, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create ease for us. Because remember that the recompense is always similar to the deed. So when you make space for others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make space for you. Where? In your grave. He will make your grave spacious. In your heart, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make your heart spacious. In the world, in your life, and also in the hereafter. So when you go to a gathering or you know a place where people are sitting, then you can ask people to make space for you. The Prophet ﷺ said that no person should ask another person to stand up from his place and then sit there himself. But he should simply say, make room for me. So don't ask other people to move away, to get up. Rather, just ask them to make some space for you. And we have also been taught to not block the way. The Prophet ﷺ warned people from sitting in the pathways, in the turuqat, in the roads. Why? Because this way people don't have the space to move around. So make space for other people and don't occupy all that space for yourself. And when you are told, arise, then arise. Meaning if you're asked to move, to create space for people, then don't get offended over there. Sometimes what happens is that you are, you know, sitting at the wrong place or you are driving comfortably and someone, you know, coming behind you and they keep asking you to, you know, signaling you to move so that they can get ahead of you, et cetera, et cetera. So when things like this happen, don't get offended over there. Don't take this personally. Just, you know, arise, make space for people, move to the side. 
Why? Because Allah will raise those who have believed among you and those who were given knowledge by degrees and Allah is acquainted with what you do. So remind yourself that honor is not by getting to sit in a certain place only or by driving in front of everybody only. No, real dignity is with faith and it is with knowledge. So if space is made for you, then thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. And when it is not made for you, for example, you ask someone to make space for you and they say sorry, or you are asked to move, then respond as a believer would respond. Meaning, then move from there. And increase in your dignity before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Respond in a way that a knowledgeable person would and increase in your honor before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that when one of you goes to a gathering and space is made for him, then he should sit there, meaning he should not reject it. For it is something that Allah has honored him with. And if space is not made for him, then he should look where there is space and should sit there. Meaning he should not get offended over there and should not, you know, take this personally that people are being so rude. No, remind yourself that real dignity is with faith and with knowledge. So act with knowledge and act as a believer would in this situation. O you who have believed, when you wish to privately consult the messenger, present before your consultation a charity. That is better for you and purer. But if you find not the means, then indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. The thing is that everybody would want to have private time with the Prophet ﷺ. But he had greater responsibilities. So this ayah was revealed that if you want to speak to him one-on-one, then you must give back to the community. You must give charity first. And the purpose over here was to teach people. And later on this was abrogated. And Ali radiallahu anhu was the only one who acted upon this verse. Have you feared to present before your consultation charity? Then when you do not And Allah has forgiven you Because this was abrogated Then at least establish prayer And give zakat And obey Allah and his messenger And Allah is acquainted with what you do Have you not considered Those who make allies of a people With whom Allah has become angry These were the hypocrites. They are neither of you nor of them. Meaning they're neither loyal to you nor are they loyal to those that they hang out with. And they swear to untruth while they know that they are lying. Allah has prepared for them a severe punishment. Indeed, it was evil that they were doing. They took their false oaths as a cover. So they averted people from the way of Allah. And for them is a humiliating punishment. Never will their wealth or their children avail them against Allah at all. Those are the companions of the fire. They will abide therein eternally. On the day, Allah will resurrect them all and they will swear to Him as they swear to you and think that they are standing on something. They think that their lies will work everywhere. Unquestionably, it is they who are the liars. Shaitan has overcome them and made them forget the remembrance of Allah. Subhanallah, ghafla. You see, ghafla is from shaitan, heedlessness. Forgetting is something natural. But when a person becomes heedless, heedless of the dhikr of Allah, then behind this is a person's own fault. So we should be careful. Those are the party of shaitan. Unquestionably, the party of shaitan, they will be the losers. Indeed, the ones who oppose Allah and His Messenger, those will be among the most Humbled. أُولَٰئِكَ فِي الْأَذَلِّينَ كَتَبَ اللَّهُ Allah has written, I will surely overcome I and my messengers. Meaning such people will be defeated for sure. Indeed, Allah is powerful and exalted in might. So those people who oppose Allah and His Messenger, they will never ever succeed. You will not find a people who believe in Allah and the last day having affection for those who oppose Allah and His Messenger even if they were their fathers or their sons or their brothers or their kindred, meaning even if they were their own family. So such people, remember, they're not worthy of friendship. So do not be in their company. Meaning, even if it's your own closest family members who are mocking Allah, His religion, His messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or they show contempt to the book of Allah, to Allah or to His messenger, then you must make your loyalties clear. 
This doesn't mean that you become rude to your family or to the people that you're around, that you become harsh with them. No, but you must speak out over there and you must make your loyalties clear and you must make it very clear that, you know what, I don't accept this. Those, meaning people who are loyal to Allah at such a time, Allah has decreed within their hearts faith. Meaning this is a sign of iman. And supported them with spirit from Him. And we will admit them to gardens beneath which rivers flow. Wherein they abide eternally. Allah is pleased with them. And they are pleased with Him. Those are the party of Allah. Unquestionably the party of Allah. They are the successful. So we see here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with the people whose concern is to please Him. So if we make our ultimate goal to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only then we can be successful. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that whoever seeks Allah's pleasure by the people's wrath, then Allah will suffice him from the people. Because sometimes you are seeking to please Allah, but certain individuals, they're not happy with what you're doing. They get annoyed by the fact that you're fasting, that you're reciting the Qur'an. Then still be firm in trying to pursue the approval of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah will protect you. He will be enough for you. And the person who seeks the people's pleasure by seeking Allah's wrath, meaning their ultimate goal is to please people. And in the process, they end up disobeying Allah and making Allah angry. Then Allah will entrust such a person to the people. And guess what? People will never be happy with them. They will accept one thing and then tomorrow they will demand something else. And then the next day they will demand something else. So don't destroy yourself and ruin yourself in seeking the approval of people. Surah Al-Hashr Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Sabbaha Lillahi Ma Fis Samawati Wa Ma Fil Ard Wa Huwa Al-Aziz Al-Hakim Whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth exalts Allah and he is the exalted in might the wise Everything in the skies and everything in the earth is praising and glorifying Allah So what should we do We should also busy ourselves in the tasbih of Allah. Remember, when you say tasbih, when you say subhanallah, then the words of dhikr, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, these words revolve around the throne of Allah. And they make a sound like the buzzing of the bees. And what happens is that they're constantly making mention of you basically. Meaning, when you make dhikr of Allah, as long as you're making dhikr of Allah, you are being mentioned around the throne of Allah. So would you not want that you are mentioned continuously in the presence of Allah? So glorify Allah, praise Allah. Remember, these are the best words that a person can utter. They are the most beloved words to Allah. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. And the words of tasbih are very heavy in the scales. And they are permanent, everlasting good deeds. Saying subhanallah is a charity. When the servant says subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers. He says, sadaqta, you have spoken the truth. When you say subhanallah al-azimi wa bihamdihi, then a date palm tree is planted for you in Jannah. Saying subhanallah a hundred times before the sun rises and before the sun sets, this is better than owning a hundred camels. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, Subhanallah, subhanallah, subhana rabbi, until sleep overcame him. So we should also make this habit. It is he who expelled the ones who disbelieved among the people of the scripture from their homes at the first gathering. You did not think they would leave and they thought that their fortresses would protect them from Allah. But the decree of Allah came upon them from where they had not expected and he cast terror into their hearts. So they destroyed their houses by their own hands and the hands of the believers. So take warning, O people of vision. We see that in Medina, a Jewish tribe known as Banu Nadir used to live. And they had made a treaty with the Muslims. But instead of abiding by that treaty, they actually attempted to kill the Prophet ﷺ. So when their treachery was exposed, they locked themselves up in their fortresses thinking that they could survive. But when did anyone ever survive by relying on other than Allah? When did anyone survive by opposing the Messenger of Allah ﷺ? What happened is that the Muslims lay a siege on them. And eventually, the Jews had to surrender. 
But now, they were not allowed to live in Medina anymore. They had to leave Medina. And they were allowed to take with them whatever that they wanted. So, they started taking apart even their doors and their window frames, destroying their homes basically with their own hands, emptying their own homes. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Take lesson, O people. What lesson? That homes do not last. Meaning your house cannot protect you. It will not survive when Allah and His Messenger are disobeyed. When a person leaves the deen, they end up losing both deen and dunya and is left with nothing. So take a lesson. And if not, that Allah had decreed for them evacuation. He would have punished them in this world. And for them in the hereafter is the punishment of the fire. That is because they opposed Allah and His Messenger. And whoever opposes Allah, then indeed Allah is severe in penalty. Whatever you have cut down of their palm trees or left standing on their trunks, it was by permission of Allah. And so He would disgrace the defiantly disobedient. So this happened during the siege, that some palm trees had to be chopped down in order to weaken the spirits of the Banu Nadir and also in order to launch an assault. Yes, it is wrong to cut trees, but it is more important to stop the oppressors and it is important to bring them to justice. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defends the believers over here. And what Allah restored of property to His Messenger from them. You did not spur for it in an expedition, any horses or camels, but Allah gives His Messengers power over whom He wills and Allah is over all things competent. So you see, when the Jews left Medina, their properties, their lands, their fortresses were still in Medina. They couldn't take those with them. So now all of that fell in the hands of the Muslims. But this was a different kind of war booty. And this is called fate. And this is different because no battle was fought. It was only a siege. And the enemy surrendered. So the distribution would be different from Ghanima. And the distribution was such that the participants did not have any share. But all of it was left to the discretion of the Prophet ﷺ. So it is made clear that what Allah restored to His Messenger from the people of the towns, it is for Allah and for the Messenger and for His near relatives and orphans and the stranded traveler. So that it will not be a perpetual distribution among the rich from among you. Meaning, this kind of gain will not just go to those who participated in the expedition. Rather, it will be left to the leader to decide how to distribute among the people. Because wealth must circulate in the society, just as blood should circulate in a body. If it gets congested in a certain place, if it begins to clot in a certain place, then that will be lethal for the community. And whatever the messenger has given you, take it. And whatever he has forbidden you, refrain from it and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is severe in penalty. Again, we are reminded that we must Take the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ very, very seriously. Whatever that he gives us, whether it is a command or a prohibition, we must abide. We must not disobey the Messenger ﷺ. Think about it. There is punishment for disobeying parents. Then what do you think? Will there not be consequences for disobeying the Prophet ﷺ? Did the Prophet ﷺ teach things in order that his teachings are rejected and ignored? No. So we must not belittle hadith. We must not pretend like the words and teachings of the Prophet ﷺ do not exist. Some people want to limit Islam to only what the Qur'an says. And this is very, very unfair. This is wrong. Disregarding the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, the treasure of you know his words that are preserved in the books of hadith, this is unfair. And this is in fact disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah is the one who has commanded us to follow him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and when Allah revealed His religion on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, He trusted His Messenger. And earlier we learned that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not speak from his own desire. So His words are to be taken as law; they are not to be belittled and ignored. 
So this war booty, this fate, this is for who? This is for the poor immigrants who were expelled from their homes and their properties, meaning the muhajirun, seeking bounty from Allah and His approval and supporting Allah and His Messenger. So there's a share for them in this. Those are the truthful because they made real sacrifices for the religion of Allah and also for those who were settled in Medina and adopted the faith before them. These are the Ansar. And what are the great qualities of the Ansar? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises them. They love those who immigrated to them and find not any want in their chest of what the immigrants were given. Subhanallah. A lot of times, you know, when we have that scarcity mindset, what happens is that if someone, you know, comes and they have to share what they have, we feel very uncomfortable. We feel like, oh, this is not fair. But the Ansar had no problem sharing their properties and their city, their homes with the Muhajirun. And even times when Muhajirun were given something, the Ansar did not feel bad but give them preference over themselves, even though they are in privation, even though they themselves would be in need at times, still they would give preference to the muhajirun. And whoever is protected from the stinginess of his soul, it is those who will be the successful. Allahu Akbar. This ayah was revealed regarding a certain companion. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu reported that once a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and said, Oh Allah's Messenger, I am suffering from fatigue and hunger. I am tired and I am hungry. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sent somebody to his wives to get something to eat, but the person came back with nothing. Why? Because there was nothing in any of the houses of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he asked his companions that is there anybody who can entertain this man tonight so that Allah will be merciful to him? An Ansari man got up and he said, I will take him, O Allah's messenger. So this Ansari man went home and he asked his wife and he said to her that this is the guest of Allah's messenger, so do not keep anything away from him, meaning be generous with him, give him food. So she said, by Allah, I have nothing but the children's food. So he said, when the children ask you for dinner, put them to bed and put out the lights and we will take our meals later. So she did so. And basically what happened is that they served the food to the guest and in the darkness they just pretended to eat. They weren't actually eating. So even though they themselves were hungry, they had not eaten dinner. Their children went to sleep hungry. They still gave preference to the guest of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the morning, the Ansari man went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah was pleased with so and so and his wife. Or he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala smiled at them. Why? Because they gave preference to others over themselves, even though they were in need. Allahu Akbar. Why? Why were they able to give preference to others? Because they didn't have any shuh in the heart. And shuh is a combination of greed and selfishness. That a person wants all the good for themselves and they're too stingy to give. They want, they're greedy for more and they're stingy to share. So extreme selfishness. And this is really a disease. It is a disease. And we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure our hearts of it. The Prophet ﷺ said that whoever protects his wealth from spending it, and he mentioned some other things also, meaning a person does not like to spend their wealth. They don't want to share anything. And these days, perhaps we're experiencing that, that these are some of the best days and nights to spend in the way of Allah, but we feel a little hesitant. So if a person feels like that, they should make dhikr. They should say, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Meaning, this will expand your heart. Because this will allow you to rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you feel stingy, then oppose your stinginess. Because of the destructive things is shuhun mutar. Meaning stinginess, that is obeyed. So don't obey it. That feeling may be there, but don't obey it. And then we see that the best charity is actually to give at a time when you're feeling greedy. Meaning when you want good things for yourself. And these days, perhaps, you know, you are just waiting for the time when the lockdown will be over so that you can go shopping and you can, you know, perhaps travel or perhaps, you know, Eid is coming so that you can spend on yourself. But, you know, you are expecting more good for yourself. This is really the best time to give charity. This is the best time to give charity.
And the way you cure stinginess is that you keep giving, you keep spending, even if it's just a little bit. And of course, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to heal you. You say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-bukhl. That, oh Allah, I seek your protection from stinginess. That you save me. You help me against it. And there is a share for those who came after them, meaning the Muslims who come after the Ansar and the Muhajirun, saying, رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ They say, our Lord, forgive us and our brothers who preceded us in faith and put not in our hearts any resentment toward those who have believed. Our Our Lord, indeed you are kind and merciful. So this is a dua that we should also make as istighfar, even at the time of suhoor, that, oh Allah, you forgive us and the rest of the believers. You see, sometimes what happens is that people ask you to make dua for them. And you cannot even remember, you know, who asked you and what dua you should make for them. So this is a very beautiful dua that we have been taught. That, oh our Lord, forgive us and forgive our brothers who have believed. Even though they believed before us, you forgive them. And remember that making dua for believers, this is a prophetic quality. Yani Ibrahim salam made dua for the believers. The Prophet wasallam would make dua for the ummah. So we should also make dua for one another. And when you make dua for one another, then an angel is appointed to make the same dua for you. Allahu Akbar. Have you not considered those who practice hypocrisy saying to their brothers who have disbelieved among the people of the scripture, meaning these were people who pretended to be Muslim, but then they sided with the Jews, that if you are expelled, we will surely leave with you and we will not obey in regard to you anyone ever. And if you are fought, we will surely aid you. But Allah testifies that they are liars. So the hypocrites, they would basically side with the Jews and they would say to them that, you know what, if the Muslims come to fight you, then we're going to defend you. And we're not going to, you know, let anybody harm you. So they would make all of these false promises to assure them of their friendship and their, you know, support. But the fact is that the person who is not sincere to Allah, a person who is not loyal to Allah, then such a person is loyal to nobody at all. How? We see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies that if they are expelled, they will not leave with them. And really, the hypocrites did not leave Medina with the Jews when the Jews were expelled. And if they are fought, they will not aid them. You see, what happened was that initially the Yehud were given 10 days to leave. After they violated the treaty, they were given 10 days that pack up and leave. But Abdullah bin Ubay, the chief hypocrite, he went to them and he said, I got you covered. Don't go at all. Stay right here. And if the Muslims fight you, I've got people who will come and defend you. And so what happened? The Muslims laid siege and then the hypocrites never showed up. They never showed up and eventually the Yahud had to surrender and they had to leave. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions here that if they are fought, they will not aid them. And even if they should aid them, they will surely turn their backs. Then thereafter, they will not be aided. This is hypocrisy, giving false hopes, making false promises. Remember that a hypocrite is not sincere to himself. A hypocrite deceives himself actually, lies to himself. And this is why his loyalty is for nobody. You believers are more fearful within their chests than Allah. That is because there are people who do not understand. It is a sign of a person's intelligence that they fear Allah. And when a person does not fear Allah and fears people more, then that is a sign of their unintelligence, of their foolishness. They will not fight you all, except within fortified cities or from behind walls. Their violence among themselves is severe. You think they're together, but their hearts are diverse. That is because there are people who do not use reason. So here the Jews are being mentioned. That apparently it seemed like they were very united. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in fact their hearts are divided. They appear united, but in fact they are united. And that is because there are people who do not use reason. You see, sensible people, they have differences, but they don't become divided over those differences. They don't fight over petty issues. They don't take such issues to heart. Al-Qushayri said that the root cause of every ill is when people are apparently united, they're apparently together, but their hearts are filled with hatred and division.
And the reason behind why people do not receive the help of Allah, meaning this is the reason why people are deprived of the help of Allah, and because of this their enemy prevails over them. So we see that a lot of problems actually stem from here. That when families, friends, co-workers, they appear to be together on the face, they're like, yeah, yeah, mashallah, you did a great job. You know, I'm here if you want my help. But then as soon as one person is missing, then they go and lay the entire blame on them. Subhanallah. When people cut each other off like this, when they entertain hatred for one another like this, they lose the help of Allah. You know, you can have your differences with people. You can have your faults. Perhaps you can even see the faults in other people. But the way to mend things is not by blaming and accusing. No, it is by communication, by solving the problem. The Prophet ﷺ said, Do not sever relations of kinship. Do not bear enmity against one another. Do not bear aversion against one another. And do not feel envy against one another. Do not do that and live as fellow brothers as Allah has commanded you. And we were also warned by the Prophet ﷺ that beware of hatred, it strips you of your religion, meaning it will destroy your religion. Theirs is like the example of those shortly before them. They tasted the bad consequence of their affair and they will have a painful punishment. So we see that this was not the first time that the Jews of Medina were expelled from Medina. There was examples before them also where people opposed the Prophet ﷺ and they did not survive. The hypocrites are like the example of shaitan. When he says to man, disbelieve. But when he disbelieves, shaitan says, indeed I am dissociated from you. Indeed I fear Allah, Lord of the worlds. Such a liar. He doesn't actually fear Allah. But he says that as an excuse. Meaning he makes a person disobey Allah, but then later on he ditches that person. So the outcome for both of them is that they will be in the fire, abiding eternally therein. And that is the recompense of the wrongdoers. So we see that the hypocrites gave false hopes to the Banu Nadir. And when they listened to the hypocrites, they only suffered. Some people are like that. They're satanic. They get others into problems. So be cautious. No matter what a person is tempting you with, when they tell you to do something wrong for their sake, then resist. Do not listen to them because it will never ever come to defend you. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, O you who have believed, ittaqullah, fear Allah, wal tamzur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghad, and let every soul look to what it has put forth for tomorrow. Every person should see what it is that they are sending ahead for their next chapter, for what is to come after death. And fear Allah. Again, this is mentioned. Indeed, Allah is acquainted with what you do. Each person needs to reflect over their condition, over their actions, that what am I doing right now? What have I done in my past and what am I doing right now? What is it that I am sending forward for my akhirah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan famulaqi. You are going towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are going to meet Him. So this meeting is inevitable. So prepare for it. Don't live in this world as if you're going to live here forever. No, death is coming. And the most wisest of people, the Prophet ﷺ said, is the one who remembers death the most and is best in preparing for it. Such people are the wisest. They are akiyasun nas. They are the most intelligent and the most wisest of people. So remember that when we die, we are going to be asked about what we did with our lives, what kind of actions we committed, how we earned our wealth and how we spent it, right? Where we spent our youth, what we learned and what we did with our knowledge. So prepare for tomorrow. Prepare for your future. And how do you prepare for your future? Not just by thinking about it, but by doing those deeds which will benefit you in the future. So we learn in a hadith that when a person is laid in their grave and, you know, when people walk away, they hear the footsteps of people. And if this person is a believer, then his salah, 
comes to his head to defend him. His fasting comes to his right side. His zakat comes to his left side. And his other good deeds, such as his charity, his, you know, voluntary prayer, and his commanding what is right, forbidding what is wrong, and his good treatment of people, etc., then all of these good deeds surround him. They come to the side of his feet and they protect him from the punishment of the grave. So, وَلْتَنظُرْ نَفْسٌ مَا قَدَّمَتْ لِغَدْ We prepare for our evening what we're going to eat for iftar. Isn't it? We prepare for what we're going to eat tomorrow for suhoor. We prepare for the next week. We prepare for the next month. We get groceries in advance. We stock up in our homes as if there's going to be no more food available in the world. Subhanallah. But we must prepare for the hereafter because that next chapter of our lives is coming very soon. So fear Allah and prepare and don't delay. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهِ And be not like those who forgot Allah. فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ So He made them forget themselves. أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ Those are the defiantly disobedient. When a person forgets Allah, when a person forgets to remember Allah, they forget their duty towards Allah. So they don't remember Him, they don't make dhikr, they don't pray, they don't recite Qur'an, they don't have taqwa of Allah, they live life as if there is no God, then such a person actually suffers themselves. Why? Because they forget higher objectives in life. They don't prepare for their meeting with Allah anymore. So they're basically selling themselves short. They're basically neglecting themselves. Think about it. You have the potential to earn, to enjoy, not just in this life, but to enjoy good things forever and for always. Because Jannah is khalidina fiha abada, right? Abiding therein eternally. But when a person forgets Allah, what are they doing? They're depriving themselves of that eternity. They are losing out, they're missing out on that eternity. So forgetting Allah is basically forgetting oneself. And when a person forgets Allah, they basically forget their own reality. Because now they fail to see their deficiencies. They fail to recognize their faults and their wrongs. They fail to see the good opportunities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them. They fail to make use of their time and their life. They fail to improve. They fail to do good things. They fail to leave sins. So they fail to reach their full potential. So don't be like those people. Such people are fasiqoon. They are defiantly disobedient. They keep falling into sin. We learn in a hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, O child of Adam, devote yourself to my worship. And what does that mean? Remember me. And when you will do that, I will fill your chest with riches and alleviate your poverty. And if you do not do that, then I will fill your hands with problems and not alleviate your poverty. Meaning you will continue to be poor and needy. Your needs will never go away. But when you will make time to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of your needs. But it is so sad that we neglect the dhikr of Allah for what? For ourselves. We think that if we cut down on our salah, we don't recite Quran, we don't make dhikr, perhaps we will be able to attend to our needs. But what happens? Our needs never get fulfilled then. Your source of fulfillment is who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So give Allah His right and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you what you need. He will fulfill you. لا يستوي أصحاب النار وأصحاب الجنة. Not equal are the companions of the fire and the companions of paradise. You see, in this life, you know, you see people who are, mashallah, studying for years, and then you know they become doctors and they become engineers and you know whatever they get a great job and they're making so much money. So you compare yourself to them and you're like, oh, okay, they became a doctor, I didn't. Well, all right, never mind. Right? Good for them. Alhamdulillah. And you know what? In this world, you can survive like that. That people reach levels that you don't reach. They make money more than you do, right? And that is fine. That's okay. But in the hereafter, people who make it to Jannah and people who make it to hell, they are not the same. This is not the same. There is a huge difference. What is the difference? أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ هُمُ الْفَائِزُونَ The companions of paradise are the attainers of success, which means that those who end up in hell are who? They are losers. So there is a huge difference. 
So don't settle for less. In this world, it's okay to settle for less if that's what you want. But when it comes to the matters of the hereafter, do not settle for less. لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَى جَبَلٍ If we had sent down this Qur'an upon a mountain, you would have seen it humbled and coming apart, breaking from the fear of Allah. And these examples we present to the people that perhaps they will give thought. So we are invited over here to reflect over the Qur'an. That Qur'an certainly has an impact on a person. Why? Because if the Qur'an can break a mountain, surely it can break you. It can affect you. So you don't have any excuse. If you feel lazy, if you feel like your heart has become very hard, then recite the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an can break a mountain, it can also break the ego and the pride which is in your heart. You know, the fixed patterns that you have become so used to, those habits, the Qur'an can break them. If you reflect upon the Qur'an, if you recite the Qur'an and you extract benefit from it, and then inshallah, you will become a better person because the Qur'an will not just break you and ruin you, it will also rebuild you. It will make you better than before. So reflect upon the Qur'an and benefit from it. هُوَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ He is Allah, other than whom there is no deity. عَالِمُ الْغَيْبِ shahada, Knower of the unseen and the witnessed. هُوَ الرَّحْمَانُ rahim He is the entirely, the extremely merciful. الرَّحِيم The especially, continuously merciful. هُوَ Allah, He is Allah. الَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ Other than whom there is no deity. He is Al-Malik, the Sovereign. So there is nothing except that He owns it. He is the true Sovereign. Al-Quddus, the extremely pure. As-Salam, the perfection, the perfectly sound, the bestower of safety. He is Al-Mu'min, the bestower of faith, the bestower of security, the one who confirms His believers, who confirms His promises, and He fulfills the hopes of the believers. He is Al-Muhaymin, the overseer, who watches over all. So he is their guardian. He is their witness. He is Al-Aziz, the exalted in might, the ever honorable. He is Al-Jabbar, the compeller, the extremely great, the extremely high, the restorer who mends the broken. Al-Mutakabbir, the superior, supremely great, possessor of all glory. Subhanallah amma yushrikun. Exalted is Allah above whatever they associate with him. Who Allah, he is Allah, Al-Khaliq, the creator, Al-Bari, the inventor, Al-Musawwir, the fashioner, the bestower of forms, Lahul Asma'ul Husna, to him belong the best names, the most beautiful, excellent names. Yusabbihu lahu ma fis samawati wal ard. Whatever is in the heavens and earth is exalting him. Wa huwa al-Azizul Hakim. And he is the exalted in might, the wise. This is the only place in the Qur'an where so many names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are mentioned together. Remember that believing in the names of Allah is part of believing in Allah. It is part of worshipping Allah. Mujahid said about the ayah, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have not created jinn and men except that they worship me. He said this means except that they should know me. Meaning we must know Allah through His names and His attributes if we are to worship Him properly. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever learns minimum 99 names of Allah, man ahsaha dakhal al-jannah, that Allah has 99 names and whoever learns them will enter jannah. And inshallah, after Ramadan, every Saturday, we will be doing our Names of Allah class. So you are welcome to join that class, inshallah, so that we can learn the names of Allah and reflect on their meanings so that we can understand, we can know who our Lord is, and we can worship Him in the best way that we can. So- Alhamdulillah, our target for uh, so far is achieved. Alhamdulillah. So let's have a quick uh, two minutes stretch break. Um, you can just roam around and um, come back in two minutes, inshallah.
والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر O you who have believed, do not take my enemies and your enemies as allies, extending to them affection while they have disbelieved in what came to you of the truth, having driven out the Prophet and yourselves only because you believe in Allah your Lord. If you have come out for jihad in my cause and seeking means to my approval, Take them not as friends. You confide to them affection, but I am most knowing of what you have concealed and what you have declared. And whoever does it among you has certainly strayed from the soundness of the way. We see that after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, very soon the Mushrikeen violated that treaty by helping and financing their allies against the allies of the Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ demanded compensation and termination of their alliances. Or else they should consider the treaty to be finished. The mushrikeen did not comply. And so the Prophet ﷺ prepared to launch an offensive in order to take over Makkah. But this was meant to be a secret. Why? To avoid any resistance on the part of the people of Makkah. Why? So that there would be no bloodshed in that land. But one companion, Hatib ibn Abi Balta, what he did is that he sent a letter secretly to the people of Makkah with this information. Why? In order to do a favor to them. So that in exchange, they would protect his family who were still in Makkah. He did this while knowing that Allah will certainly grant victory to the Prophet ﷺ. But he just wanted to ensure the safety of his family. But this was giving preference to one's own personal benefit over the benefit of the religion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses. We see that the letter never made it to Makkah, it was intercepted. And these verses were revealed that, O oh believers, what is the standard of your friendship, of your love? Who is it that you should be befriending? Who is it that you should be opposing? What is it that you are doing? If they gain dominance over you, meaning your enemy, they would be to you as enemies and extend against you their hands and their tongues with evil and they wish you would disbelieve. You're trying to do them a favor, they'll never ever reciprocate.
You are doing this in defense of your family? Well, never will your relatives or your children benefit you. The day of resurrection, He will judge between you. And Allah of what you do is seeing. So remember, the family, because of whom we disobey Allah, because of whom sometimes we earn unlawful wealth, and we do things that are impermissible, Sometimes people will, you know, take bribes or they will deal with interest, etc. Why? For the sake of their children. This is not going to help us at all. These children will never help. No relative will ever help. Remember, there is no disobedience to the Creator by obeying the creation. Meaning we should not be obeying the creation and by that disobey the Creator. This is not correct. So we learned that the Prophet ﷺ, he would call each of his relatives by name and he said to them, take whatever you want from me today because I will not be able to help you tomorrow. And remember, even the Prophets of Allah will not be able to help their families on the Day of Judgment. So we have to do our part. Abu Huraira anhu reported that the Prophet ﷺ said that a person will meet his father on the Day of Judgment and he will say, Oh my father, what kind of a son was I? So his father will say, You were an excellent son. So the son will say, that, Will you obey me today? Will you listen to me today? And the father will say, Yes. So the son will say, Just hold on to me and follow me. And like this, they will go towards the great gathering. And then eventually that son will be allowed to enter paradise. And so when he will be entering paradise, he will say, Oh my Lord, my father as well, because it is your promise that you will not humiliate me on the day of judgment. And we can see that this is Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause his father to be transformed into something else. And so he will fall into hell like that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say that, Oh my slave, is that really your father? And Ibrahim alayhi salam will say, By your honor, my Lord, this is not my father. So our relationships will not benefit us on the day of judgment if we do not believe and do good ourselves. If we do not stay away from sin ourselves. We are responsible for ourselves. There has already been for you an excellent pattern in Ibrahim and those with him. When they said to their people, indeed we are dissociated from you and from whatever you worship other than Allah, we have denied you and there has appeared between us and you animosity and hatred forever until you believe in Allah alone except for the saying of Ibrahim to his father, I will surely ask forgiveness for you because he had promised him. But I have not power to do for you anything against Allah our Lord upon you we have relied and to you we have returned and to you is the destination our Lord make us not objects of torment for the disbelievers and forgive us our Lord indeed it is you who is the exalted in might the wise there has certainly been for you in them an excellent pattern for anyone whose hope is in Allah in the last day and whoever turns away then indeed Allah is the free of need the praiseworthy perhaps Allah will put between between you and those to whom you have been enemies, among them affection, because hearts can change, and Allah is competent, and Allah is forgiving and merciful. Allah does not forbid you from those who do not fight you because of religion and do not expel you from your homes from being righteous toward them and acting justly toward them. Indeed, Allah loves those who act justly. Allah only forbids you from those who fight you because of religion and expel you from your homes and aid in your expulsion. So don't be naive. He forbids that you make allies of them. And whoever makes allies of them, then it is those who are the wrongdoers. So we see that there are three types of people, basically. The first is the believers, meaning any person who believes that we should love them for the sake of Allah, whether they are white, black, whatever race, whatever ethnicity, whatever social status, we love them for the fact that they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, there are disbelievers who oppose you, who hate you, so what do you do? You don't like them either. And you don't be deceived by them. Meaning you must be cautious and careful and defend yourself from them. And then thirdly, there are those non-Muslims who live in peace with you. They don't bother you. They don't oppose you. So you should also be likewise with them. And waging war against them for no reason is something foolish to do. Because especially when they have cooperated with you, sheltered you, not expelled you, then you should be fair with them. You should return their favor to them. 
O oh, you who have believed, when the believing women come to you as immigrants, because after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, you know, a lot of women started migrating to Medina. So it is said, examine them. Meaning first check if they have really come for the sake of Islam or is it that they're just escaping their marriage or is it some other objective? Test them. Allah is most knowing as to their faith. Meaning you just see the apparent, Allah is the judge of what is in the hearts. And if you know them to be believers, then do not return them to the disbelievers. Why? Because they are not lawful for them, nor are they lawful for them. So do not send them, but give the disbelievers what they have spent, meaning return the money that they have brought from Mecca. And there is no blame upon you if you marry them when you have given them their due compensation and hold not to marriage bonds with disbelieving women. But ask for what you have spent and let them ask for what they have spent. That is the judgment of Allah. He judges between you and Allah is knowing and wise. And if you have lost any of your wives to the disbelievers, meaning there's a woman who doesn't believe and she goes and she takes the money of the Muslims and you subsequently obtain something, then give those whose wives have gone the equivalent of what they had spent. And fear Allah in whom you are believers. So we see that the Treaty of Hudaybiyah stipulated that no man who leaves Mecca and goes to Medina should be allowed to stay in Medina. He must be returned. So the Prophet ﷺ took benefit of the letter of the law by allowing the women to stay because the word women was not mentioned in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. O Prophet ﷺ, when the believing women come to you, pledging to you that they will not associate anything with Allah, nor will they steal, nor will they commit unlawful sexual intercourse, nor will they kill their children, nor will they bring forth a slander they have invented between their arms and legs, nor will they disobey you in what is right, then accept their pledge and ask forgiveness for them of Allah. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. So we see that the Prophet ﷺ would take the Pledge of Allegiance from people who came to Medina meaning people would promise him in the name of Allah that they would do such and such things and they would refrain from certain other things and remember that when the Prophet ﷺ took bay'ah from the women this would always be verbal he would never put his hand in the hand of another woman unless she was mahram O oh, you who have believed, do not make allies of a people with whom Allah has become angry. They have despaired of reward in the hereafter, just as the disbelievers have despaired of meeting the inhabitants of the graves. So the standard of love and friendship is given over here. Because you see, friends influence your choices also. So if you befriend and sympathize with the people who oppose your deen, you will become like them. سورة الصف بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth exalts Allah and he is the exalted in might the wise so let us do tasbih also say subhanallah subhanallah walhamdulillah you see a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said ya Rasulullah I am not able to learn anything of the Quran And this happens with some people. They're unable to because of their memory loss or whatever reason may be. They're trying or they don't find the opportunity. Or for example, a woman is menstruating and she doesn't feel comfortable reciting the Quran even though there's nothing wrong with it. But people have their reservations. So this man asked the Prophet ﷺ that, what should I say? What should I say? I'm not able to recite the Quran, so what should I say? He said, say, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar, wa la hawla, wa la quwata illa billah. So anytime you're not able to recite the Quran and you feel like you're missing out, then make tasbih, say subhanallah, because these are words that are adequate in place of the Quran. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who have believed, lima taquluna ma la taf'aloon. Why do you say what you do not do? Meaning, why is it that your words contradict your actions? And why is it that you don't practice yourself what you preach? This is a severe reprimand to all believers. And every person needs to think about themselves. That are there times when I advise other people to do good and I don't do those things myself? Because this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detests. Great is hatred in the sight of Allah that you say what you do not do. Meaning when you preach something, you must practice it yourself also. 
because this is a sign, meaning people who don't practice what they preach, this is a sign that they're not worthy of being the heirs of the prophets. Because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned, "فَخَلَفَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ," that there came after the righteous an unworthy generation. And who were they? They would preach what they would not practice themselves. So this is something that is severely disliked by Allah Azza wa Jal. We see that when a person behaves like this, then there is severe punishment in the hereafter. Allahu Akbar. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned that he was shown people whose lips were being cut with scissors of fire, and when he asked, "Who are these people and why is this happening?" he was told that these are people who do different to what they say, meaning people whose words contradict their own actions, meaning they go on telling people to do good things, but they never do good themselves. In another hadith, we learn. That a man will be brought on the day of judgment, and he will be thrown in the fire of hell, and his intestines will come out, and he will go around hell fire like a donkey goes around a millstone. Astaghfirullah, and he will be going round and round in hell fire, and trails his intestines right behind him. So the people of the fire will gather around him, and they will say, "Oh, so and so, what is wrong with you? Didn't you used to order us to do good deeds?" Didn't you used to forbid us to do bad deeds? So he will reply, "Yes, I used to order you to do good deeds, but I did not do them myself. And I used to forbid you to do bad deeds, yet I used to do them myself." So it is very important that as we share good knowledge with other people, make sure that you know you practice as well. Don't just focus on sharing, on forwarding good things. And sometimes what happens is that we receive a a good video, a good post. We're so quick to share before even listening to it ourselves, before even putting into practice what that post says ourselves. So don't just focus on preaching, preaching, sharing, sharing. Also think about your own personal share. What is it that you are taking from it? Indeed, Allah loves those who fight in His cause in a row, as though they are a single structure joined firmly. So here we learn two very important things. One thing that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala does not like people to do, and the other is what Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala likes people to do. What Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala does not like people to do is that people advise others and forget themselves. And what Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala likes. For people to do is that they stand together, they come in rows, they join together in the cause of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. They unite together, and they are stronger together this way. So we see that even when we are talking to children, we should be honest. We should not make false promises. We learn in a hadith that Abdullah ibn Amir he said that my mother called me one day when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting in our house, and she said, "Come here, and I will give you something." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked her, "What did you intend to give him?" So she replied that I intended to give him some dates. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that if you were not to give him anything, a lie would be recorded against you. So we have to be careful. You know, sometimes big promises are made before marriage. Big promises are made before someone is hired, or before someone agrees to do a certain job. And then what happens once the work begins? Those promises are not fulfilled. So we must be true to our word. We must fulfill our commitments. And if we're not able to fulfill that, then let that be clear. Let that be clear. Communicate that with others so that people don't suffer because of us. And then we see that suff is especially praised over here. You know, people who are working together, working hard in a very disciplined, organized, and united way. This is what Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala loves. We see that angels form rows, and even birds. You know, they're mentioned in the Quran that they form rows. And on the day of judgment, also people will be in rows. In fact, the people of Jannah will enter paradise as rows together. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala likes this. And mention when Musa said to his people, "Oh my people, why do you harm me? Why do you bother me with your excessive questioning and your refusal to obey your hurtful words? While you are certain, while you certainly know that I am the messenger of Allah to you." And when they deviated, 
Allah caused their hearts to deviate. They chose deviation, so they were sent in the path of deviation. And Allah does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not wrong anybody. And mention, when Isa, the son of Maryam, said, O children of Israel, indeed I am the messenger of Allah to you, confirming what came before me of the Torah, and bringing good tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name is Ahmad. Allahu Akbar. He even mentioned to his people what the name of the final messenger was going to be. And Ahmad is someone who is praised. Muhammad is also someone who is praised. But when he came to them, with clear evidences, they said, this is obvious magic. And who is more unjust than one who invents about Allah untruth while he is being invited to Islam? And Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. They want to extinguish the light of Allah with their mouths, but Allah will perfect his light, although the disbelievers dislike it. Think about it. If there is a fire, can you ever put it out by blowing it with your mouth? No. Blowing a fire only causes it to increase and spread. So there are people who want to extinguish the light of Islam with their mouths, meaning with what they say, with their lies, with their insults, with their misrepresentation, with their distortion of the truth but they will never be successful. In fact, people who attack Islam at times end up becoming the very means of spreading Islam. Subhanallah. It is he who sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth to manifest it over all religion, although those who associate others with Allah dislike it. O you who have believed, shall I guide you to a transaction? Do you want to know of a business, a deal, that will save you from a painful punishment? What is it? Would you like to know an investment that you can make, a trade, a bargain that you can make because of which you will be saved from hell, from a painful punishment? تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ It is that you believe in Allah and His Messenger and strive in the cause of Allah with your wealth and your lives. That is best for you if you should know. Again, we are being reminded of spending in the way of Allah. And we see that when a person spends for the cause of Allah, for the religion of Allah, then this is something that will save them from the punishment of hell. This is something that will protect them. Again, I remind you that in these days and nights, make sure that part of your sadaqah, part of your charity, your contribution goes towards Islamic institutions. Because here, people are working not so that, you know, they get richer. No, the entire focus is on what? On spreading the knowledge of Islam. So that people get to learn what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. People get to know what Islam really is. So try to support different organizations in different ways. Contribute to your local masjid. Contribute to this organization also, Al Huda Institute, because mashallah, you have been, you know, listening to the class and a lot of people are, you know, just volunteering over here. Money is not going in any person's pocket. Subhanallah. And there's so many expenses. Subhanallah, to run an online class, to pay for these portals, to make all of these resources available to people. So try to contribute. And especially when you benefit from some place, then make sure that you put your share in it. You can contribute a little amount, a big amount. And I would request the sisters who are here that if you can share the launch good link in the comments so that people know where they can contribute. Because again, we are not spending over here so that perhaps we can get richer or perhaps this is going in the pockets of certain individuals. No, this is for our love of the Quran, our love of Islam. And with that, we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will protect us and He will save us in the next life. So, It is that you believe in Allah and His Messenger and strive in the cause of Allah with your wealth and your lives. That is best for you if you should know. He will forgive for you your sins and admit you to gardens beneath which rivers flow and pleasant dwellings in gardens of perpetual residence. That is the great attainment. 
The reward is also mentioned over here. And you will also obtain another favor that you love. Victory from Allah and an imminent conquest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you good in this life also. You will see the fruit of your effort sooner or later and give good tidings to the believers. So if you do your part, you fully strive, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also reward you. He will not leave you empty-handed. O oh, you who have believed, be supporters of Allah. Kunu ansar Allah. You see, Allah does not need our help. We are actually being honored over here by giving a chance, an opportunity to serve His deen, to promote His religion, to bring forward what we have, to support His religion. This is an opportunity for us. This is a privilege for us. So all you who have believed, be supporters of Allah. You support yourselves. Also support the deen of Allah. As when Isa, the son of Maryam, said to the disciples, Who are my supporters for Allah? So the Ansarullah. Ansarullah are who? Those who help the cause of Allah. Isa alayhi salam said, Man Ansari ilallah. Who will help me? in order to support the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The disciples said, we are the supporters of Allah. We will help. We will come forward. We will bring whatever that we can. And a faction of the children of Israel believed. And a faction disbelieved. So we supported those who believed against their enemy, and they became dominant. So history is proof that those who respond to Allah's call, who obey Allah, who strive the way that they should, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them success. Look at this. There were only 12 disciples. And one of them actually betrayed Isa alayhi salam. But Isa alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him. And the message that he brought, it did spread. So there were people up until the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam who worshipped only Allah. And Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu was one of them. All of the people who believed in Isa alayhi salam did not commit shirk. That shirk came in much later. So we see that success is from Allah. It is not because of our resources, because of our numbers. So we should never belittle that, you know what, I can only give five dollars, what is that going to do? No, you bring what you can and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for it. Surah Al-Jumu'ah بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يسبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض الملك القدوس العزيز الحكيم whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth is exalting Allah so why should we not exalt Allah he is the sovereign the pure the exalted in might the wise we see that the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم advised his daughter Fatima when she complained to him of both of her hands blistering and her body getting fatigued, he advised her to say, Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar, and Alhamdulillah. So making tasbih is actually a cure to fatigue. So if you're feeling tired right now, make some tasbih. Say, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanallah al azim it is he who has sent among the unlettered a messenger from themselves, reciting to them his verses and purifying them and teaching them the book and wisdom, although they were before in clear error. So these were the responsibilities of the Prophet wasallam, That he was to recite the verses of Allah to the people. He was to purify the people, not just give them information, but to make them better people than before. He was to teach them the book and he was to teach them the wisdom. So anyone who wishes to teach Islam, they should make sure that they're covering all of these aspects. It is not enough to only appreciate the meaning of the Book of Allah. It is also important that we learn how to recite the Book of Allah and we dedicate time to reciting the Book of Allah. And again, our focus should not just be on perfecting our recitation. It should also be on learning what the words mean. And then al-hikmah, this is wisdom. And then tazkiyah, that all of this is for action, not just for information. And he has also been sent to others of them who have not yet joined them. The Prophet ﷺ is for all people until the end of time. And Allah is the exalted in might, the wise. That is the bounty of Allah, which he gives to whom he wills. And Allah is the possessor of great bounty.
Look at the blessing of Quran. And then it is said, ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ The Quran is truly a favor of Allah. So if you have Quran in your life, you are very fortunate. The example of those who were entrusted with the Torah and then did not take it on is like that of a donkey who carries volumes of books. Meaning, these are people who once upon a time learned the book of Allah, the Torah, but then they did not implement it. They instead forgot about it. Or they only studied it and they did not practice it. So their example is like that of a donkey that is carrying a burden of books. Meaning, a donkey can also have a lot of books. But having those books is not a source of honor or privilege for the donkey because it doesn't know what those books are and what they mean. It doesn't really benefit from them. And for the donkey, the books are only a burden. Wretched is the example of the people who deny the signs of Allah and Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. So remember, if the Quran is only outside of you, meaning it is something external, something that you only talk about, or something that you only read and study, and it doesn't make it to your heart, it doesn't transform you, it doesn't grow something in your heart, it doesn't make you better, then this is not a benefit, it is not a favor, it is a curse, it is a loss. Remember the Qur'an, sacred knowledge is supposed to be internalized. So those people who just read the book without following it are being criticized over here. So the people who are true bearers of the Qur'an are people who in their lives it shows that they know the Qur'an. And this is what Ibn al-Qayyim said, that the bearers of the Qur'an are those who act upon it even if they have not memorized all of it. And a person who has memorized the Qur'an and who recites it perfectly, but he does not implement it, then such a person is not a bearer of the Qur'an. Such a person is not a carrier of the Qur'an. So we must see how the Qur'an is reflected in our lives. Say, O oh you who are Jews, if you claim that you are allies of Allah, excluding the other people, then wish for death if you should be truthful. But they will not wish for it ever because of what their hands have put forth and Allah is knowing of the wrongdoers. Say, indeed, the death from which you flee, indeed, it will meet you. It is on its way. Then you will be returned to the knower of the unseen and the witnessed and he will inform you about what you used to do. So remember, death is approaching. It has literally surrounded us. We escape death through different events in our lives, different accidents, different problems. But sooner or later, it is coming. It is going to surround us. It is going to affect us. We're not going to stay in this world forever. O oh, you who have believed, when the adhan is called for the prayer on the day of Friday, then proceed to the remembrance of Allah. Meaning, then go and listen to the khutbah and pray salah and leave trade. Meaning, stop your work, drop whatever it is that you're doing and go to the masjid. That is better for you if you only knew. And this is something that shows us that on hearing the adhan of Jumu'ah, a person should go quickly to the masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to listen to that adhan again and to be able to go pray in our masajid. And notice how it has been mentioned that go to the remembrance of Allah, which is the khutbah. Meaning that don't just go for the salah late, but go on time so that you get to listen to the khutbah. Because that is very important. That is part of Salatul Jumu'ah. And remember, the earlier a person goes, the more reward they gain. The Prophet ﷺ said about the day of Friday that this day is an Eid. It is a festival which Allah has ordained for the Muslims. Whoever comes to Friday prayer, let him take a bath. And if he has perfume, then let him put some on. And upon you is the miswak, meaning you must please, please clean your mouth before you go to the masjid. Friday is a day of forgiveness, we learn. And it is a day of du'as. Because at a certain time between Asr and Maghrib, there is a time when du'as are accepted. And there is, of course, more reward for the people who go early to the masjid on Friday. And we also learn that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring the days of the week in certain forms. And He will bring the day of Friday in a beautifully radiant and shining form. And the people of Friday... The people of Friday, who are they? They are people for whom Friday is a big deal. 
So they make that a special day. They make sure they go to the masjid. Their day revolves around the Friday prayer. So the people of Friday will surround it like a bride is surrounded when taken to her groom. So it will lighten up the way for them. So they will walk in its light. Their color is like white snow and their fragrance like musk, as if they were in mountains of kafur. Men and jinn will look at them, not turning away out of amazement until they will enter Jannah like this. So just imagine, people of Friday will enter Jannah like a royal you know, procession. Subhanallah. And none will mingle with them, meaning none will reach their ranks except the mu'adhins, meaning those who make the adhan. And in a long hadith, we learned that Friday is called Yawmul Mazid, meaning the day of increase. Because in paradise, Friday will be the day of increase in blessings. Because this is the day when people of paradise will meet their Lord. So they will become even more beautiful. And they will become even more happy. And they will increase in their blessings even more. So give importance to this day. You know, these days, because we're not able to go to the masjid for Jumu'ah, you know, and sometimes we don't even know what day of the week it is, Friday is still special. Just because we're not able to go to the masjid on Friday, it doesn't mean that Friday has become unimportant now. It is still important. We should still send salat on the Prophet ﷺ on Friday. We should still recite Surah Al-Kahf on Friday. We should still increase in our dhikr on Friday. فَإِذَا قُضِيَةِ الصَّلَاةِ And when the prayer has been concluded, then disperse within the land and seek from the bounty of Allah. Meaning then go back to work and remember Allah often that you may succeed. So you see, dhikr of Allah is mentioned. Make dhikr so that you may be successful. So dhikr is a path to success. But when they saw a transaction or a diversion, they rushed to it and left you standing. Say what is with Allah is better than diversion and than a transaction. And Allah is the best of providers. Indication is to the time when the Prophet ﷺ was once giving Jumu'ah khutbah and a caravan arrived in Medina bringing supplies and you know food and goods and making a lot of noise so that people would come and shop. And it was very, very tempting for the people who were sitting in the masjid. So one by one, people started leaving the masjid in order to go to the market and buy food and the goods that had just arrived because they were afraid that if they were to go after salah, then they wouldn't find anything. Subhanallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah. That what is with Allah is better. It is better. So yes, you are tempted to go shop and do your work and make money, etc., But the reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to give, that is way better for you. So yes, when it comes to your obligations, then you must prioritize them. You must give them preference over your worldly needs. And when you have fulfilled your obligation towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then of course you go and fulfill your worldly needs. But don't give preference to worldly needs over worship. سورة المنافقون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم When the hypocrites come to you, they say we testify that you are the messenger of Allah. And Allah knows that you are His messenger. And Allah testifies that the hypocrites are liars. Astaghfirullah. The hypocrites would say with their mouths that they are Muslim, but their hearts did not testify. And this is why their words are rejected over here. They would say, we bear witness that you are the messenger of Allah. And Allah says that the hypocrites are lying. Meaning, even though the statement that they're saying is true, meaning that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the messenger of Allah, their testimony, meaning they're saying it, they're saying that we believe in it, that is not true. So we see that a hypocrite lies, a hypocrite deceives, a hypocrite uses false oaths to be more believable to people. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept such lies. This is why we should refrain from lying. And we should be afraid lest we develop hypocrisy in our hearts. And we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. They have taken their oaths as a cover. So they averted people from the way of Allah. Indeed, it was evil that they were doing. That is because they believed and then they disbelieved. So their hearts were sealed over and they do not understand. And when you see them, their forms please you. Because their entire focus is on pleasing people, right? So their entire focus is on their image. So their bodies, their clothes, their physical appearance, mashallah, 
very nice, muscular and fit and well-dressed and so beautiful and handsome. But if they speak, you listen to their speech, meaning in their words also they're very, very impressive. They are as if they were pieces of wood propped up meaning they're empty and faithless. They only look good outside, but in reality, they are useless. They don't really bring any benefit. If you think about it, pieces of wood that are propped up against a wall, what benefit are they? They're useless. So just like that, there are people who pay a lot of attention to their physical well-being, to their you know physical appearance. And what good is that? If you're not using your physical strength to help people, if you're not using the strengths that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you to worship Him, if you're not using your strengths, your money, your resources to help the religion of Allah, they think that every shout is against them. Meaning inside, they are very, very guilty. They're cowards. They are the enemy. So beware of them. May Allah destroy them. How are they deluded? We see that the Prophet ﷺ said that two things will never be together in a hypocrite. Good manners and fiqh, understanding in the religion. He also said that what I fear for my ummah the most is the hypocrite who is alim al-lisan. Meaning he knows how to speak well. And through his words, he convinces people. And when it is said to them, come, the Messenger of Allah will ask forgiveness for you. They turn their heads aside. And you see them evading while they're arrogant. Meaning they don't like to come to the Prophet ﷺ. It is all the same for them. Whether you ask forgiveness for them or do not ask forgiveness for them, never will Allah forgive them. Indeed, Allah does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. They are the ones who say, do not spend on those who are with the Messenger of Allah until they disband. And to Allah belong the depository of the heavens and the earth but the hypocrites do not understand they say if we return to Medina the more honored meaning the one who has more power will surely expel their from the more humble because the hypocrites consider themselves to be more honorable and Abdullah bin Ubay actually said this on one of the expeditions he was really upset about something and he said when we go back to Medina the one who has more honorable will expel the one who does not have honor basically what he was saying was when we get back to Medina I'm going to expel Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Astaghfirullah. And to Allah belongs all honor and to His Messenger and to the believers. But the hypocrites do not know. O you who have believed, let not your wealth and your children divert you from remembrance of Allah. You see, it was the love of wealth, it was the love of their families that caused these people to become hypocrites. And whoever does that, then those are the losers. So we are advised here that do not let your family and your things make you so busy that you forget to remember Allah. The remembrance of Allah is food for the soul. It is nourishment for the heart. It is a path to success. So yes, you have to be with your family. You have to do your work. You have to look after your wealth. But then when it is time for prayer, it is time to remember Allah, then you have to make time for salah, as the Prophet ﷺ would. And spend in the way of Allah, from what we have provided you, before death approaches one of you, and he says, My Lord, if only you would delay me for a brief term, so I would give charity and be among the righteous. Astaghfirullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Sometimes we delay giving charity. We say that, you know what? Next month, inshallah. Next Ramadan, inshallah. We keep delaying. Who knows if we're going to get that opportunity again? It doesn't mean that a person just gives everything that they have and next day they're begging for money. They're begging for food. No. It means that, yes, you fulfill your needs and then you see whatever you have that is left over. You know, you would like to save that for your, you know, enjoyment and your pleasure later on in life. But some of that, spend it for your own benefit. Spend it in good causes so that in the hereafter, you're not empty handed. You have something that is waiting for you. You have something that will benefit you. So give of what you have. But never will Allah delay a soul when its time has come and Allah is acquainted with what you do. So give charity before your death. 
the Prophet ﷺ said that do not delay charity until the time when death approaches you. And then you say, give to so and so, and give to so and so, and give this much to that cause, and give that much to that cause. There's no point in that. Why? Because when you die, you're going to die very soon. And now your wealth is no longer yours anyway. It's going to go to other people anyway. So give charity while you have health and you are hopeful and you want to enjoy your wealth yourself. Perhaps you fear poverty and you expect to become more wealthy. Give. Give for your own benefit. Surah At-Taghabun Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Yusabbihu lillahi ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard Whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth is exalting Allah To him belongs dominion and to him belongs all praise and he is over all things competent It is he who created you and among you is the disbeliever and among you is the believer and Allah of what you do is seeing Allah is watching our deeds He created the heavens and the earth in truth and formed you and perfected your forms subhanallah and to him is the final destination he knows what is within the heavens and the earth and knows what you conceal and what you declare and allah is knowing of that within the chests why should he not know when he has created us has there not come to you the news of those who disbelieved before so they tasted the bad consequence of their affair and they will have a painful punishment that is because their messengers used to come to them with clear evidences but they said shall human beings guide us Meaning they dismissed the messenger simply because they were human and disbelieved and turned away and Allah dispensed with them. He didn't need them and Allah is free of need and praiseworthy. Those who disbelieve have claimed that they will never be resurrected. Say, yes, by my Lord, you will surely be resurrected. Then you will surely be informed of what you did. And that for Allah is easy. Everything has a consequence. You think you are an exception? What you do will also bring its results. So believe in Allah and His Messenger and the light which we have sent down. What is this light? The Qur'an. And Allah is acquainted with what you do. The day He will assemble you for the day of assembly, that is the day of deprivation. Subhanallah. The day of judgment is called Yawm at The day of deprivation, because it is the day when some people will lose and others will gain. And whoever believes in Allah and does righteousness, he will remove from him his misdeeds and admit him to gardens beneath which rivers flow, wherein they will abide forever. That is the great attainment. So remember, on the day of judgment, the believers will gain and the disbelievers will lose. Some people will gain Jannah and other people will lose themselves and their families and their properties and their deeds and whatever else that they had. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardon us. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا But the ones who disbelieved and denied our verses, those are the companions of the fire, abiding eternally therein. And wretched is the destination. No disaster strikes except by permission of Allah. And whoever believes in Allah, He will guide his heart. وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِ قَلْبَ This means that when a person is struck by difficulty and they believe in Allah, meaning they remind themselves that this is by the permission of Allah and Allah's decision is with His wisdom. It is with His mercy. It is with His knowledge. So I trust Allah Azza wa Jal. Then what will happen? Allah will guide his heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also give him peace. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide this person to say what is right and to do what is right. Allah will guide him. Wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim. And Allah is knowing of all things. Remember, if the heart is guided, then the entire person is guided. And if the heart is not guided, then nothing will be guided. The words will not be right. The actions will not be right. Our response to the situation that we are in cannot be right. So it is important that whenever we are struck by any difficulty, the first thing we do is that we think about Allah. We put our trust in Allah and obey Allah and obey the Messenger. But if you turn away, then upon our Messenger is only the duty of clear notification. Allah, there is no deity except Him. And upon Allah, let the believers rely. All you who have believed, indeed among your wives, your spouses and your children are enemies to you. How? How can they be enemies? 
because sometimes they become a hurdle for you. They prevent you from obeying Allah. You love them. They love you. But sometimes that love becomes unhealthy when it prevents you from obeying Allah and worshipping Him. So beware of them. Be careful around them. Meaning, don't abandon them. Of course, that's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to do. But at the same time, beware of them. Realize that in their love, sometimes you end up neglecting your duty to Allah. You end up falling short in your duty to Allah. So yes, love your spouse, love your children, but not unconditionally that you lose yourself. You forget about who you are and you forget about your obligation, your duty to Allah. But if you pardon and overlook and forgive, subhanAllah, this is what you're supposed to show to your family. Notice three words of forgiveness are used here. Pardon, overlook, forgive. Intarfu, tasfahu, taghfiru. What does that mean? You have to forgive your family, your children, your spouse again and again and again. You have to overlook their mistakes again and again and again. Because if you don't and you keep fighting all the time, you keep arguing all the time, then you're only going to make life difficult for yourself. Then indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. So keep forgiving and overlooking the annoyances of your family. Even when they oppose you in your religion. You know, sometimes it happens that when you are available for your family, they don't remember anything. But the moment you open up the Mus'haf to recite the Qur'an, then everybody remembers all the things that they have to ask you and all the things that they need from you. So you get annoyed over there. You get irritated over there. But you must pardon and overlook. Meaning you must respond to them in a beautiful way. Don't be impatient. Don't be angry. Don't be harsh over there. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu was asked about this ayah and he explained that there were some people who accepted Islam in Mecca and they wanted to come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They wanted to make the hijrah but their families would stop them. That no, don't go. And then there were also some people in Medina who whenever they intended to participate in jihad with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, again their families would stop them. That please don't go. So sometimes your own family stops you, right? And that is not coming from a bad place. They love you and they want to be with you. And this is why sometimes in their love, they don't want you to be away from them. They would rather that you spend time with them. But you know how the Prophet ﷺ one night, he got up in order to pray. And he said to Aisha radiallahu anha, that, oh Aisha, allow me, let me worship my Lord. And Aisha radiallahu anha answered that I love that you are with me, meaning I want that you should be with me, but I also love that you worship Allah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa got up and he performed salah. And he was given the final concluding verses of Surah Ali Imran at that time. And he wept so much that the place of his sajda was wet with his tears. His beard was also wet with his tears. So this is how we need to be with our family. That you know what? I love you, but I also want the best for you. So yes, go and study something. Yes, go and you know serve your parents. I love you. I want the best for you. So yes, sit down and recite some Quran. I would rather talk to you, but I respect the fact that you want to you know worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this time. This is the kind of love and support we need to offer but sometimes we don't always get that support from our loved ones so that is where we need to show forgiveness your wealth and your children are but a trial so you will be tested sometimes you will have that support from your children from your spouse and other times you will not so this is a test and Allah has with him a great reward so fear Allah as much as you are able, meaning do whatever that is within your capacity, the maximum that you can. And listen and obey and spend. Again, sadaqah is mentioned. Give in the way of Allah, because what will sadaqah do? It will expiate for your sins. It is better for yourselves and whoever is protected from the stinginess of his soul. It is those who will be the successful. So the real hurdle is really inside of ourselves. It is in our hearts. And for that, we need to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help. It's very easy to blame your family that, oh, they don't let me. Oh, they make me angry. But we need to focus on what is it that I can do. If you loan Allah a goodly loan, what you give in the cause of Allah is actually a loan. Allah will give you back. He will multiply it for you. And He will also forgive you. And Allah is most appreciative and forbearing. Knower of the unseen and the witness, the exalted in might, the wise. So the fact is that if we were honest, when it comes to our relationship with our families, we would know that we are not perfect. 
we make mistakes. And so a man asked the Prophet ﷺ about this. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned certain good deeds. And of them is sadaqah, charity. That this is something that expiates for the mistakes that you make towards your family. For the places where you fall short in your duty towards your family. And there are times when because of your family, because of your loved ones, you end up falling short in your duty to Allah. So how do you compensate for that? Keep giving sadaqah. Surah Al-Talaq. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when you Muslims divorce women, divorce them for the commencement of their waiting period. Meaning give the divorce at a time when a woman can actually begin her idda. And keep count of the waiting period and fear Allah, your Lord. Do not turn them out of their husband's houses. Do not kick them out. Nor should they leave. Meaning they should not leave themselves in rage unless they are committing a clear immorality. And those are the limits set by Allah. And whoever transgresses the limits of Allah has certainly wronged himself. You know not, perhaps Allah will bring about after that a different matter. So be hopeful. And when they have nearly fulfilled their term, either retain them according to acceptable terms or part with them according to acceptable terms and bring to witness two just men from among you. And O witnesses, establish the testimony for Allah. That is instructed to whoever should believe in Allah and the last day. And whoever fears Allah, he will make for him a way out. So we see that even talaq, divorce, has to be done properly. When it comes to weddings, what is it that we don't know about? Yani we know all the customs and traditions and you know all the latest designs and all the latest decorations. We have borrowed from different cultures and we are so particular about you know this party and that party and this event and that detail. But when it comes to the religious laws, how a marriage is to be conducted and how people are to live with one another, we don't know. And when it comes to divorce, we are even more ignorant. So people follow their desires only when it comes to divorce. And it is mentioned over here, this is instructed to whoever should believe in Allah in the last day. Meaning if you believe in Allah in the last day, then you must go through divorce properly also. And whoever fears Allah, then Allah will make a way out for him. Subhanallah. Earlier we learned that whoever believes in Allah, Allah will guide his heart. Here we learned that whoever fears Allah, then Allah will make a way out for him. Where? In this life and also in the next. Meaning any trouble, any difficulty, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create a way. And one of the scholars said, this means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a way for him towards Jannah. So you don't know, something so painful that you're going through, such as divorce, something that is so difficult, but if you do it the right way, following the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are related to divorce, you never know, this might be the very reason why you enter Jannah. Subhanallah. وَيَرْزُقُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And will provide for him from where he does not even expect. Meaning from where a person cannot even imagine. Because a lot of times people like to ignore the laws of Islam related to divorce. And they want to follow their desire. Why? Because of money. That they want to get money from the person that they're divorcing or their family. So what is mentioned over here? You fear Allah. You do things the right way. Allah will not deprive you. He will provide you from where you cannot even imagine. And whoever relies upon Allah, then Allah is sufficient for him. Indeed, Allah will accomplish his purpose. Meaning things that are meant to happen will happen. Allah has already set for everything a decreed extent. So your freedom, your money, your time that you have, your marriage that you have, any everything that you have is limited. And through these limited things, you are being tested. And those who no longer expect menstruation among your women, if you doubt, then their period of idda, of waiting, is three lunar months. And also for those who have not menstruated, and for those who are pregnant, their term is until they give birth. And whoever fears Allah, he will make for him of his matter ease. That is the command of Allah, which he has sent down to you. And whoever fears Allah, he will remove for him his misdeeds. And make great for him his reward. Subhanallah. How appreciative is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is reward for leaving sin even. These are the benefits of taqwa. During the waiting period, where is the woman supposed to stay? 
It is said, lodge them in a section of where you dwell out of your means and do not harm them in order to oppress them. And sometimes what happens is that the divorce is issued and immediately the woman is sent away. That you cannot even come back over here. You cannot even come to get your things. You know, the locks to the house are changed so that a woman cannot even get back to her house and get the things that she needs. And if they should be pregnant, then spend on them until they give birth. It is the man's responsibility to do that. And if they breastfeed for you, meaning the baby, then give them their payment and confer. Decide among yourselves in the acceptable way. But if you are in discord, then there may breastfeed for the father another woman. Meaning then someone else can be hired to nurse the child. This is also an option. Let a man of wealth spend from his wealth. And he whose provision is restricted, let him spend from what Allah has given him. Allah does not charge a soul except according to what he has given it. Allah will bring about after hardship ease. So there is ease after hardship. You see over here, divorce is being mentioned. And it is being made very clear that the man has to spend on his wife. Right? When, when she's pregnant, when she gives birth. And even if he divorces her while she's pregnant, she's no longer his wife. Yet he still, after the woman gives birth, then that woman is no longer married to him. But still the man has to give money to who? To the mother of his child. He has to give her enough food, you know, enough money so that she has enough clothes, enough food. What does that show? that a man must spend on his wife and on his children. And this is an obligation and this is something rewardable. Don't be stingy in this matter. A lot of men will, you know, spend on their friends, on dinner, on their entertainment. But when it comes to spending on their wives and their children, they become very, very stingy over there. The Prophet ﷺ said, that you are rewarded for even the bite of food that you put in the mouth of your wife. You are rewarded for this. So why be stingy? And how many a city was insolent toward the command of its Lord and his messenger? So we took it to severe account and punished it with a terrible punishment. And it tasted the bad consequence of its affair. And the outcome of its affair was loss. Allah has prepared for them a severe punishment. So fear Allah, O you of understanding who have believed. Take a lesson. Allah has sent down to you a reminder. He sent a messenger reciting to you the distinct verses of Allah that he may bring out those who believe and do righteous deeds from darknesses into the light. And whoever believes in Allah and does righteousness, he will admit him into gardens beneath which rivers flow to abide therein forever. Allah will have perfected for him a provision. It is Allah who has created seven heavens and of the earth the like of them, meaning multiple earths also. His command descends among them so you may know that Allah is over all things competent and that Allah has encompassed all things in knowledge. So the fact is that nothing escapes His knowledge and you are His creation. Everywhere Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command is implemented and you have been given the choice to either obey the command that Allah has given you or disobey. What are you going to do? So even in terms of marriage and divorce, pay regard to the commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given. Surah Al-Tahreem, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why do you prohibit yourself from what Allah has made lawful for you, seeking the approval of your wives? And Allah is forgiving and merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not even allow his messenger to make what is lawful into unlawful for the sake of someone that he loved. So then how can we? Allah has already ordained for you Muslims the dissolution of your oaths. And Allah is your protector. And He is the knowing, the wise. And remember when the Prophet ﷺ confided to one of his wives a statement. And because it was a secret, it was supposed to be a secret. But she informed another of it. And when she did that, Allah informed him about it. The Prophet ﷺ made known part of it to her and ignored a part. You see, there's a certain background to these verses. The Prophet ﷺ would go to his wives and at times, of course, there would be jealousy between them. So once the Prophet ﷺ spent, you know, a little longer duration with one of the wives and he had honey. So some of the other wives of the Prophet ﷺ, they felt really jealous. So they, you know, confided together that we will tell him that because of whatever you ate, you have bad breath. And the Prophet ﷺ did not like bad breath at all. So when he was told, not just by one, but by two wives, he said, I am never going to eat this honey again. 
And when the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this, this was supposed to be a secret. But what happened? She told another wife of the Prophet ﷺ about it. And this was not right. Remember, when your spouse shares something private with you, then that is between you and your spouse. And you should respect that privacy. In the Qur'an we are told that righteous women are hafilat, that they are those who diligently guard. Guard what? The secrets, the private matters that are shared with them. And the same is expected of a man. That please, respect your wife's privacy. Yani if she has shared something with you, let that be a private matter between you and her. And don't go on spreading it to the world. So we see over here that the Prophet ﷺ, he found out that this you know secret had been shared by someone. So what did he do? He expressed some of it and he ignored part of it. Meaning he let her know that yes, I know that you shared this with someone, but he did not attack her full on. And this is something very, very important. Sometimes you know your spouse has made a mistake. Please don't shame them and embarrass them by listing, oh, you said this and then you did this and then you raised your eyebrows and then you used that word and then your tone was louder and then you were stomping and then you went here and then you went there. Any, we remember the faults of our spouse to such a great length. Get over it. Don't be so petty. Any, move on. Be tolerant with the people that you live with. Learn to ignore and overlook the mistakes of people. And this is a sign of a dignified person. And when he informed her about it, she said, who told you this? He said, I was informed by the knowing, the acquainted. If you too repent to Allah, it is best for your hearts have deviated. This was a mistake. But if you cooperate against the Prophet wasallam, then indeed Allah is his protector and Jibreel and the righteous of the believers and the angels moreover are his assistants. Perhaps his Lord, if the Prophet divorced you all, would substitute for him wives better than you. So the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam are being taught a very important lesson here that do not bother the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam again. Don't gang up against him again, because he can replace you with someone else who will be submitting to Allah, believing, devoutly obedient, repentant, worshiping, and traveling. Once previously married and virgins, being that doesn't matter. What matters is their Islam, their iman, and their taqwa. And then we are addressed, O oh, you who have believed, protect yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is people and stones over which are appointed angels, harsh and severe. They do not disobey Allah in what He commands them, but do what they are commanded. Astaghfirullah. O oh, you who have disbelieved, make no excuses that day. You will only be recompensed for what you used to do. O oh, you who have believed, repent to Allah with sincere repentance. Honestly, repent to Allah. With your tongue, seek forgiveness. With your body, leave sin. With your heart, resolve to never repeat the sin again. And make tawbah with your environment also, meaning change your situation. Perhaps your Lord will remove from you your misdeeds and admit you into gardens beneath which rivers flow on the day when Allah will not disgrace the Prophet and those who believed with him. Their light will proceed before them and on their right they will say, Our Lord, perfect for us our light and forgive us. Indeed, you are over all things competent. Ya ayyuhan nabi, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, strive against the disbelievers and the hypocrites and be harsh upon them and their refuge is hell and wretched is the destination. Subhanallah, wretched is the destination. Earlier we learned in the previous ayah about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will perfect the light of His Prophet and the righteous. And remember there are certain deeds because of which light will be increased for a person. And these are making wudu properly and going to the masjid, walking to the masjid specifically, and reciting Surah Al-Kahf on Friday, and giving sadaqah, because was sadaqah to nur. And also, we learned that if a person becomes old in Islam, then that will be a source of light for them on the Day of Judgment. Allah presents an example of those who disbelieved. The wife of Nuh and the wife of Lut, they were under two of our righteous servants, but betrayed them. So those prophets did not avail them from Allah at all. And it was said, enter the fire with those who enter. These were women whose husbands were prophets, whose husbands were righteous and pious. So this shows us that a husband's piety will not benefit the wife if she herself is not pious, if she does not take responsibility for herself.
Because a lot of times what happens is that after marriage, women tend to neglect themselves. They almost make their husbands into their objects of worship. That now their entire life revolves around pleasing the husband. And that should not be the case. Yes, your husband is important, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even more important. And Allah presents an example of those who believed. The wife of Fir'aun, when she said, My Lord, build for me near you a house in paradise. Rabbi ibn li'inda kabaytan fil jannah. And save me from Fir'aun and his deeds. And save me from the wrongdoing people. What a wise, intelligent woman she was. Her husband was not a believer. Her husband was actually Fir'aun, a denier, an oppressor, an arrogant man. But she is an example for the believers. Look at her goal. She wanted a house in Jannah. She had a house in dunya, right? And she knew what the worth of that house was. And she understood that the real home is the home of the hereafter. Real success is in closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not in closeness to people, to the creation, but in closeness to Allah. And the example of Maryam, the daughter of Imran, who guarded her chastity. So we blew into her garment through our angel. And she believed in the words of her Lord and his scriptures and was of the devoutly obedient. She spent hours in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, consistently worshipping him. So we see that Maryam was a single woman. She was not even married. So it's not about who you are married to. It's about what you do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of His devoutly obedient servants whose goal is to please Him and to be close to Him. Azza wa Jal. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakallah khair, uh, everyone, for um, your patience. Uh, subhanallah, we are a bit uh, up the time, but alhamdulillah, we have covered uh, just 28. Uh, quick um, uh, review for action points that we have to do, as the sister told us, that we have to give sadaqah and uh, we have to watch our tongue while we are speaking. Always greet others just like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to. And um, then we have to, like, um, uh, these are the beautiful days for Sadafa, so just avail this opportunity. Then we have to, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them who do not displease um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to please others. So we have to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our top priority. Uh, we don't have to um, say anything is halal or haram on our own, but whatever Allah has made permissible, uh, we always uh, call that halal or whatever it is forbidden is uh, haram for us. And um, there are a few more things that we uh, learn from it. Inshallah, I am pretty sure that you have made a note for yourself. Uh, till tomorrow, um, uh, take, take care of yourself, inshallah. Let's end it today here. Uh, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.